Compared to my videos about Neolithic long barrows, about mosaics in Roman villas, my work about medieval monasteries seems almost contemporary. And that's a direction I don't want to go. It's the distant past that interests me most. So, naturally, I've now moved to the 1950s. To be precise, to events that unfolded during a four-day period beginning on the 7th of October 1957. If a small number of people had not made exactly the right decisions, if they had, to some extent, been a little bit less lucky, I would not be standing here, three quarters of a century later. This would be a no-go area, a radioactive wasteland, and that would include the Lake District, an area of outstanding natural beauty a few miles to the east of here. We were saved by the skin of our teeth. We are at the beautiful, slightly obscure church of Ponsonby, about one kilometre northeast of Sellafield site in Cumbria. Sellafield started to be more than just a field in World War II. Located in the far northeast of England, it was chosen as a good place for an ordnance factory, out of easy reach of Germany's Luftwaffe. After the war, it became Britain's main location for research and plutonium production for nuclear weapons. I am talking, of course, about the wind-scale Pile 1 nuclear reactor incident. Not only is this a move in the wrong direction in time for the Stone Age aficionado, it is also a subject that has been discussed in thousands of publications, TV programmes and YouTube videos. Sounds just like the thing I would do. So what was the wind-scale Pile 1 incident? Why were those reactors built that way and at that point in time? And what have they achieved? What have we learned from all of this? In the next few minutes, we'll try and find out. The best way to understand nuclear fission in general, and Pile 1 and its accident in particular, is to wait for a dry, sunny weekend in late February, look at some highlights of the lovely Lake District, and have a chat about the physics side as we toddle along. First port of call, Castle Rigg's Stone Circle. Castle Rigg's Stone Circle dates from about 3000 BC. It has been said that in its special location it is perhaps the visually most impressive prehistoric monument. And I'd certainly agree to that statement, just look around. It's about 500 years older than current Stonehenge. But then, at 3000 BC, Stonehenge might have looked fairly similar. What always struck me is how small the stones are. How easily they could have been damaged, removed, fallen victim to vandalism either by religious fanatics, the early Christians, or by simple ploughing. Durvent Water and, just outside of Keswick, Durvent Island, with its manor house, has always been one of my favourites. It just looks like the place you want to live, until you realise that every trip into town would mean a boat ride. Its most notorious owner, the 18th century Joseph Pocklington, had the manor house and some mock fortifications built and, once a year, he made the townspeople attack him with boats while he shot at them with his cannons. And such has always been the British respect for eccentricity that they seem to have gone along without considering it too odd. Parking at the Kettlewell National Trust car park brings us within a ten-minute walk of Lodor waterfalls. From there we will climb up steeply. To the left of the waterfalls is a public footpath that will eventually bring us to the High Seat, a 600 metre lake district peak that should be ideal for a refreshing climb and for explaining all about plutonium and the Pile 1 fire among the general out of breathness. Good idea to have a waterfall behind me so we don't hear the huffing and puffing I produce by walking up this rather steep path. What a stupid idea to walk up a steep path 
while explaining radioactive fission. So here goes. Bear with me. I haven't got any notes, so I'm sure there's a little bit of detail which I misrepresent or have left out. We have talked about how Ernest Rutherford had discovered that the atom is made up of pretty much nothing. Remember my video with the Christmas bauble which demonstrated just how much space is between the nucleus and the electron cloud. Now, imagine people's excitement when on top of all of this they found out that the nucleus of the atom actually is made out of separate bits as well. In 1932, James Chadwick discovered the neutron at the Cavendish lab in Cambridge, I believe. And people got very excited about that. Amongst others, a trio in Berlin of the name of Strassmann, Hahn and Meitner. Of the three, it is Otto Hahn and Lise Meitner we remember most these days. Otto Hahn is famously credited for being the first to split the atom. Got a Nobel Prize for that in 1944 in chemistry of all subjects. That Lisa Meitner didn't share that Nobel Prize upset many, still today, including myself. The team in Berlin decided to bombard heavy atoms with neutrons to produce different isotopes, thorium, uranium, amongst others. And imagine their surprise when suddenly they found that the resulting nuclei sometimes behaved like much lighter atoms, cesium, iodine, stuff like that. There could only be one explanation. They had smashed their uranium to bits. Nuclear fission was found. to shed some insulation there. The steep ascent making me feel so hot and bothered that I was running the risk of bursting into flames, creating my own event of nuclear fission. <coughs> the splitting of the nucleus releases a huge amount of energy. That's because the remaining lighter atoms of a much stabler, lower energy type. Not also does it release a lot of energy. Amongst the particles it produces are other neutrons. Now they can fly on, hit another heavy nucleus, another uranium, split that and so on. And you will see that as the process goes on and you have a macroscopic quantity, a few kilograms of uranium, this so-called chain reaction will split it all up. That split-up process would happen in a matter of microseconds. The energy released in that process is truly humongous. You will have created a nuclear bomb. Amongst the people who realized this possibility was Albert Einstein and he feared that with the German determination to smash the world to bits they would not stop until they had actually 
created such a device. He wrote a letter addressed to President Franklin D. Roosevelt about that possibility and urged him to start a national US program that would result in a nuclear bomb. Roosevelt understood and the Manhattan Project under the leadership of Robert Oppenheimer was created. Do watch the film Oppenheimer. <coughs> it's about one hour too long and the physicists amongst you will wince here and there when uh, scientific truth is sacrificed sometimes a bit too obviously on the altar of good storytelling. But by and large it gives you a good impression of how things must have been back then. The Manhattan Project would not have been the success it was in the time it was achieved had it not been for the British contribution. By that time the British had started their own programme to create a nuclear weapon but then merged it with the Americans, offered up all their research so far to ensure that in a joint effort things moved along quickly, as they did. So picture the British government's chagrin and dismay when they found that, contrary to starting an age of joint nuclear research, the Americans had banned, by way of the McMahon Act, all foreign nationals from participating in nuclear research, including the British, including intellectual property that had actually been created by the British in the first place. Something had to be done. As horrible as these weapons are, I think the British government made the right decision in starting its own nuclear programme. Just imagine how unsafe the world would be where only the Russians have nuclear weapons. So how to go about it? To create a nuclear bomb you need a nucleus that is ready to throw itself into bits at the slightest provocation. Two so-called isotopes of the elements uranium and plutonium are known to do this, to be precise, uranium-235 and plutonium-239. Uranium-235 can be found in nature, but to be used in a weapon has to be purified from a mixture with its far more abundant, useless sibling, uranium-238. Back in the 1940s and 1950s that process, called enrichment, cost a stupid for the United Kingdom impossible amount of effort and energy. Plutonium-239, on the other hand, can be created by the much simpler process of building a reactor fired with natural uranium and waiting until the neutron bombardment therein has created a sufficient amount of plutonium to be extracted in a comparatively simple process. That's the way the British government decided to go. The old ordnance factory just south of Whitehaven seemed ideal. Remote, and yet with the right infrastructure and prospect of a suitable local workforce. Two reactors were built, now known as Pile 1 and Pile 2. In 1950 they were ready to go and started to produce weapons-grade plutonium. What is a wind-scale pile? Well, it's essentially a block of graphite about the size, the volume of half a squash cord, with horizontal boreholes through it. In those boreholes inserted are the fuel rods. If I remember correctly, they are about a foot long and about as thick as your arm, with cooling fins around them. The fuel rods are stuck in from the front, and the next fuel rod is stuck in after that. 
And the idea is that when the first fuel rod is sufficiently irradiated to have enough plutonium-239 in it, it folds out at the back. Now, why graphite? For a nuclear reactor to work properly, you need to slow down the neutrons coming out of nuclear fission. Otherwise, you won't sustain a chain reaction with those low levels of enrichment. In fact, actually natural uranium. You need something to slow the neutrons down and that's called a moderator. It turns out that graphite is a really good moderator. If the neutrons fly through there, they slow down sufficiently that they become really annoying for the next uranium nucleus they hit and so that splits apart and you've got a sustained chain reaction. Now graphite is not without its issues. It is for example bedeviled by something we call Wigner energy, named after the physicist of that name. Graphite is carbon atoms packed very densely in a crystal configuration. With all the neutrons zipping about in the graphite core of the reactor, every now and then a carbon atom gets knocked out of place in the crystal. That puts it into a configuration of higher energy. It doesn't fall back. So with the reactor running by and by, more and more carbon atoms get knocked out of their crystal configuration and this stores a huge amount of potential energy over time. When that gets suddenly released, you can see a dramatic heat up of the reactor core and that can become dangerous. So what people did is a process called annealing. Every now and then the reactor would be heated up beyond 250 degrees Celsius and that would make the graphite plastic and the neutrons, the carbon atoms, I should say, fall back into place. Indeed, on that fateful 7th of October 1957, a sudden heat up of the reactor core was observed and naturally people assumed that it was Wigner energy. An annealing process was ordered. The reactor was heated up but it didn't heat up in the way it was supposed to. Essentially only one channel got hotter, or a few channels got hotter, and the rest of the reactor got cooler. This was very strange. What had actually happened was not Wigner energy, but a fire in one of the reactor boreholes. A fuel rod had caught fire. That was something not totally unexpected. Now we know, but back on that fateful 7th October 1957, the operators ramped up the fans, increasing the airflow to really cool that obstinate reactor down. Except they weren't cooling down a functioning reactor. Unknowingly, they were fanning the flames in a reactor already on fire. You see, different from the later, much improved Magnox reactors, the windscale piles were cooled with air. Back in the late 1940s, a decision had to be made based on speed. The nuclear arms race of the early Cold War was reaching its peak and weapons-grade plutonium had to be made as soon as possible. The Simples design won, although everybody knew that in the event of a core fire one would be in trouble. In October 1957 that chicken came home to roost. But not everything was done quickly and on the cheap. The project leader John Cockroft had learned of the danger of radioactive emissions through the stack in case of a fuel malfunction. Against a lot of resistance he managed to have high performance filters installed at the last minute and hence at the top of the by then mostly finished stacks. Those filters gave the pile chimneys their rather ominous look we got used to over the following decades. Mockingly, the windscale engineers gave them the nickname Cockroft's Folly. Cockroft went on to win the 1951 Nobel Prize for splitting the atom, and his filters saved northern England six years later. They held back 90% of the radioactive isotopes emitted during the windscale fire. Amongst them, vicious specimens such as iodine-131 and polonium-210. Eventually it was Tom Dewey, the technical director of the pile reactors, who made the only possible decision. Cool down the reactors with water. Now that in itself was not without any risk. You see, water hitting very hot metal surfaces like the uranium of the fuel rods is likely to shed its oxygen and become just gaseous hydrogen, a highly explosive gas.
Had that happened, the piles would have just exploded. As it turns out, it didn't happen. The fire cooled down, eventually went out, and the piles were sealed up. Cockroft's Follies, those life-saving filters, have given the wind-scale piles their characteristic look for many decades. Today they are history, and whilst that is a good thing, it shows progress in decommissioning, part of me feels a bit uneasy about that. You see, they've always been a stark reminder of an occasion where scientific diligence, yes costly, had won over austerity. And I can say from first-hand experience that that is becoming increasingly rare. Back in the 1950s it was Cockroft's insistence and victory that likely saved thousands of lives and prevented a beautiful part of the country becoming inaccessible for centuries. Since then our knowledge of the physics of nuclear fission has increased dramatically and today's approach to risk management and risk mitigation makes incidents like this highly unlikely or actually impossible. But we may want to keep an eye on these kind of things. We seem to be letting our world completely run by accountants and investment bankers, watching the pennies scientists spend. Let's hope that doesn't let us in for some bad surprise in the future. <laughs>